wellness and just thrilled to welcome all of you tonight to our presentation um, one fight two winners and um, and really excited to have so many people from all over the country so welcome I am going to pass the baton to our beloved leader George Papa George great hey friends how's everybody doing great to have you back I am curious on if you weren't able to join us last time and you are here tonight for the first time, wave your arms if you're here for the first time. Okay, welcome. Cool, cool. Keep waving if you're here for the first time. I'm just glancing across the pages here. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, welcome to all. And, and we you know deeply appreciate those back who were with us last time and then excited that if you didn't make it last time, you found us and uh, of course, thanks to uh, Johanna, Director of Youth and Young Adult, who we partner with, but she does so much of the emailing out to you and all of all the connections there. So we're really happy that you're all here. Um, we're going to start here uh, with a prayer with His Eminence in a moment, but I just wanted to say that as, as Lent is happening, um, I always have this little bit of a hopeful ex anticipation when Lent, Lent starts and then this inevitable anxiety, which is that sometimes I have found, I, I'm hopeful that I had some kind of great, great Lent. Every year I'm hopeful. And more often than I like to admit, it sort of flies by. And what I find is like life gets in the way of great Lent. And then Pascha happens and I eat too much. And then I have to get hopeful like a year later that it ended up being more grounded for me than maybe it was that particular year. So as I'm hopeful that we all have a very meaningful Great Lent, but recognizing that somehow life can get in the way, we're also hopeful that we can come home to a better marriage, which is the title of our series. But very often, life, oddly enough, life can get in the way of a better marriage. So, and I'm cheating a little bit because we're down here in Mexico, so I'm about as zen as you can get, but... Um, nonetheless anxiety can follow us everywhere and so i just want us to whether it's literally take a breath or in our life take a breath that we try to just sink into the present moment uh, really look forward to what father tom is going to be sharing with us it happens to be a talk that is on conflict which actually is through conflict very often that life gets in the way of a better marriage so I'm delighted that tonight we could find God's uh, illumination as Father Tom shares with us, that we could actually experience conflict in a different way. And in a way that we would christen, we would bring our conflict um, patterns to the cross during this great Lent. And that literally as we're reflecting on it, as Father Tom shares some great insights tonight, we literally can be picturing the way in which we ind individuals do conflict and consider bringing that to the cross this Lenten period. As very often, if it's anything like me, my patterns need to die at the cross so that they can be resurrected and blessed by, by true um, touch of the Lord. So we welcome you, your eminence, if you would, Open us in a word of prayer and bless us as we start our class. Thank you, George. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Fathers, thank you so much for uh, having me here this evening again. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Lord, as we continue our journey through great and holy land, may we be strengthened by your grace and your love and your peace. May our hearts and minds be focused on you and the ultimate sacrifice you made upon the cross for our salvation. Guide us to worship at the foot of your cross and lead us to a glorious celebration of your holy resurrection. Help us to speak in love, to only share words of support, and to be kind to one another. 
Let us follow your examples of selflessness and humility in all our actions with our spouses, families, and friends, so that we may be true seekers of your will for our lives and doers of your good works, so that every day we may bring praise and honor and worship to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever and to the ages of ages. Amen. Thank you so much, Your Eminence. Again, we are so grateful that you are with us yes, through this entire series, and we appreciate your guidance and love. So thank, thank you. you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Presbyteria Pat Sagalakis here greeting you from Seattle. I'm um, the Assistant Director of Family Wellness, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you um, our speaker, who is right next to me, who is my beloved husband, Father Tom. And um, this subject of conflict and finding a way to deal with conflict as a married couple impacted us very early in our marriage when I came home and I told him honey I bought a piano <laughs> and he looked at me like you bought what and it was this we had no money and we no were, money <laughs> we didn't <laughs> but I'm a musician and I needed a piano I found a deal on a upright piano like five hundred dollars and this was the biggest expense we'd ever ever expense and the next so, week she bought a thousand dollar rug okay so again we entered a little bit of marital conflict and we didn't really know how to navigate through conflict. And if we would have learned these things to get through, it would have made things a lot easier. So we are so grateful that you're here with us today to share how we can enter into having one fight and two winners. And so I am going to now pass it on to my sweet beloved husband, Father Tom, who is always making surprises. Okay, everybody, uh, I'm going to talk to you about conflict, and I just have some halilium to break the, break the ice, okay? Okay, just wanted to You can't hear them bit. laughing at the you end. You can't hear me laughing. You no, know, conflict is probably the best thing you all wanted to talk about on a, on a wonderful thir uh, Thursday night, but I, I think if we, conflict is probably as a therapist, as a father, as a friend, as a, as a priest, it's probably the most powerful thing that we need to consider uh, how to respond to. And I, I'd like for you to look at this for a moment. And what's, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you see this? Many people that tell me when they look at this, they say, gosh, I, I, I see that all the time when we get in a funky place with my husband or my wife or my boyfriend, or my girlfriend, or my friend or family member. And what happens is, you know, you, it's a depressed look. You're looking down, the, you see the sculpture. Um, in such a sad way. And what I wanna talk about today at, at the depth of who we are, we are created for connection. George, uh, Papa George last week and, and Father Vasily reamed it in us and that's God created us to be connected. Let's get that straight. That's at the core of what we're gonna talk about today. And you see that right now, whatever conflict, whatever metal barrier, whatever spiritual barrier, whatever mental barrier, there is a deep desire that God created within us to be connected. That's the deal. And when we're connected, we want to be loved, right? We all want to be loved and we all want to be understood and we all want to be appreciated. And when that gets distorted a little bit, then conflict happens within us and then, or from our partner, and then it causes this disturbance. From last uh, talk, George did a beautiful job in reminding us to have a committed heart and a humble heart. We've got to be willing to personally grow and cultivate our marriages and our relationships. And a lot of times we're clueless to that. We rarely wonder, what is it about me that I need to learn to help in my conflict? And George did a beautiful job in, in asking us to take responsibility to tune into our own, our own <laughs> rumblings, to tune into for our, our partner, our friend, see what's going on to take personal responsibility and the more we can respond from that godly loving place in conflict you'll see you'll I'll, i'm telling you that's the this is the ingredient you're going to pay for intimacy when you do it well we're going to have one fight two winners one conflict two winners when we did our our session last month we asked the question when were couples feeling the most disconnected and i don't know about you but how many of you really really love conflict Really, 
the top choice, what people said is when we're in conflict, that's the time that I hate. We're in disconnected. It's yucky. It doesn't feel good. And I rather not do it. When I ask you to think about your own uh, response to conflict, how you do it, how you think about it, where do you go? In your family, did you learn how to do it well? Did you learn to fear it? Conflict is just telling us something's going on with our bodies, with our emotions, something's disconnected. It's how we respond to conflict that becomes disastrous. Listen to some things that people have told me. How they view conflict. This is the common response. And if we ask- Me against something and something against me. I'm afraid of conflict. It makes me feel too vulnerable. I hate it. I love conflict. I'm always up for a good fight. I always tell it like it is. Too often we get defensive, trying to prove our point, which then starts a cycle of anger, hurt, and blame. Fighting makes me anxious. Someone always gets hurt. It's not worth it and I avoid it because it never turns out peaceful. Disagreements force us to open up in a way that is often not comfortable, but sometimes it disconnects us and other times it's a positive force for change if we are really listening to each other. The people pleaser, I'd rather give in than deal with conflict. When we are in conflict, we yell at each other. It's when two people stand their ground, both feeling they are victims and recipients of one another's criticism. So for me, when I think of conflict, I, I, I can tell you so many events. And one that comes to mind is when my family took a trip to Greece, we went to a monastery. First time I took our kids to a monastery, it's a convent in Thiva, Holy Cross. And it was amazing. And we finished the service. We had something to eat. I was talking to the abbess. <clears throat> and all of a sudden my kids, I think Nicholas was nine years old and Maria was seven. And they started coming, dad, 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 they need a conflict resolution person. Dad, they need a conflict resolution person. So what's going on? I said, that lady's got a broom and she's hitting the other nun, hitting the other nun. I said, what's going on? So I found out that the lady from Georgia uh, was telling my kids to broom, to sweep. And the lady from Athens, Greece was upset at the lady from Athens, Georgia, that the kids were doing her job. And she was upset that these visitors were doing work. Conflict happens everywhere. So let me share with you a little bit about what I hope tonight we can do, at least to change your attitude about conflict because most people don't like it. And I think we don't like it because we've not learned it to do it very well. For me, I remember when I was asked not to go to the creek as a little kid because my mom didn't want me to get dirty. And I remember one time I snuck out there with my brother and I came back with muddy shoes and she asked me, Puisuna, where were you? With a not nowhere, Puisuna, Pesmo. Where were you? Tell me. Well, they're not. Nowhere. Because I was mortified inside. And all of a sudden, Pesmo or Pesmo Alicia. So she said, tell the truth. So I told her I was at the creek. And then she said, what? I told you not to go there. Bah, poof. <laughs> she slapped me. I'm thinking, that's the last time I'm going to tell the truth to my mother. I learned really well. Conflict taught me to shut up. Conflict taught me it's not safe to be honest. And that's what I want to help us realize with God's grace, honesty will move us into a holy space. Conflict is really, it, it helps us realize something's dissonant, out of tune, out of balance. Something's disconnected in us, in the relationship, and we need reconnection. And let me ask you a question. Probably tomorrow morning around 7, 8, 9, 10 o'clock, there's going to be a conflict. You know what that conflict's going to be? In your tummy? it's gonna be out of balance. It's gonna say, I need food so I can have it balanced. Are you gonna get upset at your tummy? Are you gonna get mad? No, you're gonna take care of that, right? It's an invitation to connection. Uh, I remember when I had a little poke in my chest like four years ago, there was a conflict in my heart. My heart was saying something's going on. To make a long story short, I was that close of dying. If I didn't listen to conflict, if I didn't welcome that conflict, I would have been dead. Very amazing how we tune into conflict or how we push away conflict depending on what we learned about it. Again, conflict is saying something's not quite right and needs uh, a, a reconnection. So conflict is an invitation for reconnection. Something got out of balance, we need reconnection. Something is in disunion, we need to find a balance and it leads into a union and transformation when, when we do it well. What I like to do now is have the poll question. We always like to get your pulse. 
And uh, Johanna? Yes, this is one of our favorite parts of the evening. I'll go ahead and launch the poll. It is a question first for the women to answer with their response and the men to answer with their response. But here's the question. What is your general approach to conflict? So for the women, the first part, it offers an opportunity to understand my spouse. I usually become numb, quiet, or don't say anything. I usually feel someone is right and the other wrong. I say whatever my spouse wants to hear. And then again, if your spouse or significant other is not there, you can click that one to be able to move on and submit your answer. So just take a moment to look through those answers, see which one speaks most closely to your heart. This is anonymous, so don't worry, no one knows what you're voting for. Um, so just click that one and then scroll down um, and let your partner answer the other question. All right, I'll go ahead and end it now. And here are our results. So for the women, the one that was um, responded with the most response is I usually feel someone is right and the other is wrong, followed closely by I usually become numb, quiet, or don't say anything. And then for the men, very similar response is I usually feel someone is right and the other is wrong, followed second by the same one for the women. I usually become numb, quiet, or don't say anything. Father Tom, do you have any thoughts? I think it, it, it proves really what, what we struggle with. We're, we're really not sure how to do it well. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a common denominator because I think we get hurt in our families where we've grown up and it's been usually disastrous and we've not done it well. So who wants to do something over and over the same way and um, really be hurt by conflict, right? Most of the times I hear people are hurt when they engage in conflict. So it makes sense to me. So let's, let's I wanna switch over into what I'd like to do is talk about who we are as human beings, because like George said, and Father Vasily said, and we all sit, maintain in the church, we're created for connection. Our faith proclaims that, that God is the ultimate giver of secure connection and love. We are created for connection and made in the very image of God. We bear the likeness of the one who made us <clears throat> in love and for love. And here's, here's the deal. When I left church on Forgiveness Sunday, I thought of what a tragedy it was that humanity, that Adam and Eve, who had a perfect environment to hang out with God and creation, decided to listen to someone else, to, to, to listen to the doubts and lies and deception that ultimately dis, uh, created disconnection and division. And the response of the very first conflict, I don't know if you ever thought about this. For me, it shook my world. It, 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 it was the first conflict was after they partook of the apple, whatever that was that disconnected their head and their heart, that disconnected them from God. There was one question, three words that was asked of Adam. And God said, where are you? And what happens, that question, I don't know about you, when you ruined everything for the universe and God says, where are you? I don't know how you would act. Adam was cruising around doing his own thing and he had a respond to that reality that he did something not okay. The only response to that is truth. But here's what he said. He said, I can't say anything. I'm afraid. I'm so afraid. False expectations appearing real is what happened. False expectations appearing real. Probably Adam was shamed and he was also hiding and also lying and also blaming. So what happens when we get in conflict, we go back to the garden, many of us, and we respond from these fear, shame, hiding space, and we start lying and pretending and keeping the truth from ourselves and our friends or our partners or spouse. Then we create havoc. We create disaster because we can't be honest with God. I really feel if this is their only response, I can't believe I messed up, Lord. I screwed up all of the universe. I was afraid to tell you. I know I did the wrong thing. He was telling me to talk to you. I was afraid to talk to you. I thought you were going to hurt me, but I'm so sorry. That's the only response. So we got to stop when we have one fight, two winners. We got to stop and find ways to not do this kind of response and reaction <clears throat> to conflict. 
Because really, where did Adam go? He went away. It wasn't him. Where are you, Adam? And where do you go when you go to conflict? I always hear people, you know, when I look at my husband or when I look at my wife or my partner or my friend or my boyfriend or girlfriend, when something goes on between us, I look in their eyes and he's not there or she's not there. Or he's not the same. Where did they go? And the church is saying, we want you to come back home so we can respond to the thing that maybe hurt you or got you scared in a helpful, courageous way. So we want you to find ways to have the courage to not be dictated by fear, but to have courage to respond in honesty, to not hide, but to find ways to be open with your friend and your spouse or your partner. The only way to, to live is to live in truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. I am the vine. I am the way. And a lot of times we get in trouble because we have to lie because we're afraid if we tell the truth like I did when I was a kid, I get in trouble. So blaming, taking responsibility. We can't, if you find yourself blaming, if you find yourself lying or pretending or hiding, if you find yourself afraid, trust me, there's something that needs to happen with you so you can have the courage to become Christ-like again so you can respond with that open sense and open heart. Because this is what Adam also said. God says, where are you? And we say that to our spouse. And conversely, we say to our spouse, are, are you there? Spouse or God, are you there to love me? Are you there to understand me? Are you there to hold me? Are you there to forgive me? Or are you there to hurt me? Are you there to abandon me? Are you there to shame me? Are you there to judge me? Are you there to blame me? I'm telling you, that response is always going to lead to fear, hiding, lying, and blaming. When we have trust, like those little kids in there, that I want so much to, to, to hold you and, and be close to you, that that's so important in our journey, in our relationships. St. Simeon, the new theologian, said, And God said to Adam, Adam, where are you? Why does the maker of all things speak in this way? Surely it is because God wants to wake him up, to come to his senses and wishes to make Adam conscience, thus calling him to repentance. Adam, where are you? Is as though God speaks to encourage him. Come to your senses, poor fellow. Come out of your hiding place. Just say, I have sinned and come back to me. St. Simeon, the new theologian. So again, the question is, where do we go? And I, I want to use this metaphor of a, a circuit breaker. And what happens is God, conflict, listen, God's megaphone, conflict is God's megaphone letting us know our head and our heart is disconnected. Something's going on. It's not that you're bad or your spouse or your friend is bad. It's telling you something so important. And I talk about the red wire, the red wire being connecting our head and our heart when things are well, things are going nicely, things are smoothly, we're at peace. This is the place where you walk really confident. But yet <clears throat> what happens is when conflict happens is there's this, this is what happened in the garden. There's a disconnect. It's like the circuit breaker goes off and there's the life force does not uh, in, 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 imbue us and the purple wire connects. And I call the purple wire, the purple wire of negative thoughts, the purple wire of blaming and judging the purple wire that tells us to feel we're stupid, we're not good enough, and that feeds us and moves us. And then we react from that purple wire, from that not healthy place. And I wanna show you a little bit, Father Vasily shared a little bit last week, and then I'm gonna show you a film that I want us to wonder how we have these automatic negative thoughts that control us. We need to get back to reconnecting our head and our heart when we respond to any conflict. And trust me, when you do that, you don't need to have somebody be a winner or loser. <clears throat> we will find a way to engage in the godly way. One last thing, I'll show you a little tape. So here's the deal. This is what happened in the garden. If you can think, everyone put your thumb up like this. Say hi, everyone. Hi, put your thumb up. Here's the brain science, really quick brain science. Father Vasily was sharing it. We're going to probably do it every time because this is what happens. This is what happened in the garden. It what happens, it's what happens today. It's this thing called the amygdala. Uh, they call it the limbic system, system or the reptilian mind. What happens is it's the, it's the thing that when we feel any danger or we're in harm's way or we're going to be hurt, it could be real or perce perceived or real. This thing will active, activate and take over our, and we call this the brainstem. And if this is our heart and our mind connected, 
when we're walking like this, we're at peace, we're doing great, everything's wonderful. But what happens is, let's say I'm walking in the desert and all of a sudden I see a snake, this thing's gonna pop. I'm gonna pop my lid and this amygdala is gonna take over my body and it's gonna move me into a fight, flight or freeze response. And what happens is in our marriages, because we learn how to do conflict in not healthy ways, any little look, any little thing will pop our lid. And what happens, the amygdala is gonna take over and I call it the loyizmi. Some people call it gremlin. Some people call it the, the demon. This thing takes over. And then we try to resolve conflict with our lid popped open. The only way we can do it is if we stop and recalibrate, reconnect our hearts and our minds, the red wire, so we can respond with God's grace. This is what happens with unhealthy conflict. We have stress and anxiety. Who wants that? Poor health, hostility, anger, abuse, and violence. We get hurt and disconnected. We start yelling and shouting. Healthy conflict invites us to slow down. I can't tell you when people get, they, they get revved up. We need to find a way to understand and be understood. We need to share from the heart. We need to seek Christ to respond to the conflict because a lot of times we do conflict on our own. We need to gain insight and identify issues because if something's off balance, I want my wife to help me or I want to help my wife. We need to find solutions and we need reconnection and transformation. That's what happens when we look at conflict as a, a, as a warning sign from God that we need to tend to something. I'm going to ask you to watch this video. We're going to have a breakout group. And I want you to really pay attention. What is going on with this couple? It's a movie, The Breakup. And so we're going to watch them. It's a five-minute video. I want you to pay attention to what you notice happening to yourself and what's happening in the video. It's pretty intense. Well, I'm gonna go do the dishes. Cool. It'd be nice if you help me. No problem. Uh, we'll get them a little bit later. I'm just gonna hit the streets here for a little bit. Gary, come on. I don't wanna do them later. Let's just do them now. Take 15 minutes. Oh, honey, I am so exhausted. I just honestly wanna relax for a little bit. If I could just sit here, let my food digest, and just try to enjoy the quiet for a little bit. Get some, get some, get some. That's what happens, and we will Oh, we can clean the dishes tomorrow. Gary, you know, I don't like waking up to a dirty kitchen. Who cares? I care, all right? I care. I busted my ass all day cleaning this house and then cooking that meal, and I worked today. It would be nice if you said thank you and helped me with the dishes. Fine. I'll help you do the dishes. Oh, come on. You know what? No, that's, see, that's not what I want. You just said that you want me to help you do the dishes. I want you to want to do the dishes. Why would I want to do dishes? Why? See, that's my whole point. Let me see if I'm following this, okay? Are you telling me that you're upset because I don't have a strong desire to clean dishes? No, I'm upset because you don't have a strong desire to offer to do the dishes. I just did. After I asked you. Miss Brooke, you're acting crazy again. Don't you call me crazy. I am not crazy. I didn't call you crazy. Just I didn't did. call you crazy. No, I didn't. I said you're acting crazy. You know what, Gary? I asked you to do one thing today, one very simple thing, to bring me 12 lemons, and you brought me three. God, if I knew that it was gonna be this much trouble, I would have brought home 24 lemons, even 100 lemons. I know what I wish? I wish everyone that was there had their own little private bag of lemons. Gary, it's not that. about the lemons. Well, that's all you're talking about. I'm just saying it's, it'd be nice if you did things that I asked. It would be even nicer if you did things without me having to ask you. Well, I do seem to remember doing something for you this morning without you asking. Gary, come on. <laughs> I'm you know what? No, Come I'm here. serious. I, am too. I really am. Come on, you knew I was working today and I made that meal, and you could have thought to yourself, you know, you could have said, you know, I, I'm, I think I'm going to get Brooke some flowers. You said on our very first date that you don't like flowers, that they're a waste of money. Every girl likes flowers, Gary. You say that you don't like flowers. I'm supposed to take that to mean that you do like flowers? No, this is not about, you're not, you're not, you're, you're, that you're not getting it. You're not getting this, Gary. Okay, it's not about the lemons. It's not about the flowers. It's not about the dishes. It's just, um, how many times do I have to drop hints about the ballet? You know I can't stay. Brooke, come here. We talked about the damn ballet. I hate ballet. You got a bunch of dudes in tights flopping around for three hours. It's like a medieval techno show. It's a nightmare. I sit there in a sweat. The whole thing, I do. It's not about you loving the ballet, Gary. It's about the person that you love loves the ballet and you want to spend time with that person. Not when they're at the ballet. Okay, forget the ballet. I forget the ballet. We don't go anywhere together. We just went to Ann Arbor together. To Ann Arbor? 
to the Michigan Notre Dame game. You think you think screaming drunk kids and leprechauns doing backflips? That's fun. That's fun for me. Come on, man. I did that for you. What do you? How do you show up for me? I'm up on the bus every. Damn day Come for you. on! You I'm busting my ass to be the best tour guide in the city, so I can make enough money to support both of us, and hopefully you won't have to work one day. I want to work. All I ask, Brooke, is that you show a little bit of appreciation that I just get 20 minutes to relax when I come home instead of being attacked with questions and nag the whole damn thing. You think that I nag you? That's all you do. All you do is nag me. The bathroom's a mess. Your belt doesn't match. Hey, Gary, you should probably go work out. Nothing I ever do is ever good enough. I just want to be left the hell alone. Really? Is that what you want, Gary? Is that what you want? Yeah. That's what you want? Yeah. Fine, great, do whatever you want. You leave your socks all over this house, dress like a pig, play your stupid video game, I don't care, I'm done. What? I am done! I don't deserve this, I really do not deserve this. I deserve somebody who gives a shit. I'm not spending one more second of this life with some inconsiderate prick! Everyone take a deep breath. <sighs> uh, maybe you don't experience things like that, but trust me, there's a lot of things within that that video that we all can relate to. What I like to do is we can have a breakout group for about 10 minutes. I know we're running, we started a little bit late and I'll try to squeeze things in, but I'd like for you to, to write down and think about what did you notice while watching this movie? What do you believe the husband was trying to say? And what do you believe the wife was trying to say? And would it matter to you if you knew the dinner that happened before this was a disaster for the husband? He endured a crazy bunch of people. They wanted to bring friends over for the, for the dinner. And he, I think, got disconnected. And I think he felt really horrible. And he just wanted to check out with the video. Con conversely, the, the wife was saying, I'm going to do the dishes. What she was saying was, what? I feel alone. Could you help me? Probably other things. But go in your breakout room, uh, Joanna, and we'll be back in about... 10 minutes after you discuss this as best you can. So as Father Tom mentioned, we'll be going into breakout rooms and we'll have members of the family wellness team and a few others that we've designated to help act as breakout room facilitators. And this is a great opportunity to get to know other couples as well and grow our Orthodox community. And so we encourage you, if no pressure, you don't have to, but if you wanna, if for some reason your screen isn't on, when you get into the breakout room, that might be a time where you may wanna turn your screen on so you can engage with people face-to-face, -face, heart to heart. So just do it right as you answer. And um, I, I put the question in the chat, so you have those questions there for you. Um, but I'll go ahead and launch the breakout rooms right now. So I hope you enjoy this time together. It's a perfect example of what happens. We, we, we um, again, uh, Father Vasily shared this last week, all about how we respond from a godlike centered place. When the red wire is connected, we can deal with almost any conflict, trust me. But when the amygdala flips and this takes over and controls our mouth and our actions in unhealthy ways, and I'll show you a few unhealthy ways that uh, happens, because um, I want to show you another video at the end that kind of synthesizes what we're talking about. Here's the thing, <laughs> one fight, two winners is what this evening is about. Here's a deal, if you find yourself in any way blaming, if you blame in any way where you think you have to be right and the other person's wrong, you got to step back and realize we both have a story. 
because what happens is your spouse or your friend might feel, okay, there's the bosses here, but inside the blamer is someone who's lonely and um, feels um, unsuccessful or unworthy. Another thing is what I've seen is this idea of attacking and pursuing uh, this idea of one partner withdraws the other. You saw that in the movie, right? You saw in the movie where, you know, she came at him. said, what do you mean, Gary? I mean, Gary, what do you mean? He said, you know, I, I'm going to do the dishes. And she goes, I busted my ass, cleaning the house, cooking the meal. What she was complaining was she did everything while he came from work and he just enjoyed the dinner. She said, it would be nice if you did things that I didn't have to ask you. And then she kept on, instead of saying, I don't feel appreciated, instead of her saying the truth, like Adam and Eve, if they said to God, if we tell the truth to one another, then we can enjoy that reality that, okay, our feelings are hurt and then we don't have to explode. So one partner withdraws, the other partner responds with escalating judgment. Watch when you do that. It's a sure indication that you need to back off and you not, don't need to fight each other. You need to fight what hooks you into making that happen. This is why I say conflict is beautiful. It helps us become connected if we do it well. And we can do it well, we stop doing it this kind. Freeze and flee. Let me tell you a story. It's isolating, withdrawing, disconnecting. Um, it looks like nothing is going on. I have a, 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 a book start, a study I did, and I asked the question, what's one non-negotiable rule in your family? And there's one person said, one non-negotiable rule in my family was you had to be honest and you had to be um, kind. And she said, I grew up with anxiety in my family because I started freezing and fleeing because when there was a choice to be honest or kind, you know what my mother chose? She chose kindness. And I was sought the honesty. She was lying to us. And I, did, I didn't feel safe in my house because she wanted to be kind at the expense of protecting us from the truth. This is what God wants us. He wants the truth. The truth will set you free. This is why conflict can be so beautiful when we really have maybe somebody to help us because I'm telling you, the amygdala in any perceived or real danger, it'll pop open and you lost uh, <clears throat> the dance. Placator, uh, watch yourself when you agree just to avoid conflict. Oh, whatever you want's okay. I'm here to make you happy. I'm really helpless. Your body's saying, I'm helpless. Whatever you want. And really inside this person who's always saying, you know, I'll do whatever you want to just avoid conflict and you at the expense of being honest, right? We go back to the garden, we become afraid, we get ashamed, we feel unworthy, then we start hiding. We start hiding, we start lying, and it's all curtains, and we start playing a game. Um, so here's the deal. If we can find ways to be grounded from the heart with that red wire, speaking with that boldness and with that love and with that commitment to be like Christ in the moment, treating your partner like Christ in the moment, who wants to hurt Jesus? You never would. But this is what the devil wants to do, he wants to disconnect you, let the purple wire feed you negative energy, and you get crazy. So here's the deal. Pay attention to decide, at least from now through Lent, to recognize when you're about to escalate into unhealthy conflict, stop and breathe. Because what George and Father Facili shared last time is we gotta pay attention. The stethoscope's gotta go to our heart. Because if we're not ready to be open to a conversation, if we're, our, our, if we're walking around with our lid pop, normally we're never gonna have a good conversation. So we need to find a way to invite God to discover the solution so we can speak from the heart, so we can listen and hear the other person's story without interruption, without judgment. Why do you have to interrupt and judge? They just want to tell their story. And when we can hold their story in a safe place. And plus, I'm going to share this. If you find yourself in a violent, abusive position, conflict can be very, very uh, prickly. And if you do find yourself in, you have to trust your heart that this is not safe. You have to trust your heart to realize, I need to find a way to honor that if this is not safe and my boundaries are being disrespected, I gotta find some help so I can be clear in how to respond to the person I'm trying to love or who's trying to love me. We need to honor and respect another person trying to stay open and curious. And the body, facial, tone needs to match that we're connected with God's grace so we can have a conversation. And if we can't, put it on the table so we can have it tomorrow or the next day. But you gotta revisit it 
with that love. I wanna show you this video. I will call it a night because she does a really fantastic job helping us realize that really behind the conflict are two beautiful hurt people that want really deep connection. Check this out from Sharon Mead. To help us understand, let's look at two bits of love science. Number one is the emotional center of the brain. It's a very old part of the nervous system and treats the potential loss of your happy home life as a code red emergency. It gets your body ready for fight or flight and shuts down unnecessary functions like rational thought. The second comes from Newton's third law of motion. You know, the one about for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. So back to Wallace and Pat. It makes sense that they think the problem is the other person, but this is called find the bad guy, and it's a lose-lose proposition. Either you are the bad guy, or you are with a bad guy, and who wants that? Yet both Wallace and Pat make sense in their own ways. Let's look at them one at a time. First, Pat. When Pat feels far away from Wallace or they're fighting, Pat fears being alone, unimportant, invisible, helpless. And because of that, Pat feels sad or lonely, frustrated, irritated, angry. All this creates the fight or flight response. Pat wants Wallace to come closer, but what Pat says sounds like demands or criticisms. So Wallace sees Pat saying, you're always gone. You never listen to me. I have to do everything by myself. I can't get through to you. You just don't care. But Pat has longings and softer feelings under this protest. Like, I miss you. I want to know I matter to you. I want to be a full partner. I can't find you. I want to be loved by you. Saying these kinds of things is hard because Pat doesn't know whether Wallace will respond lovingly. And Pat may be right about that. So let's look at Wallace. When Wallace feels far away from Pat or they're fighting, Wallace fears being inadequate, misunderstood, helpless. And because of that, Wallace feels sad or numb, frustrated, irritated, angry. Again, a fight or flight response. So, of course, Wallace wants the conflict to end, but what Wallace does seems like abandonment to Pat. This is what Pat sees. Wallace may freeze, saying nothing, or make empty promises like I'll try to do better, or disappear. Wallace may build a wall and go behind it. Wallace might get defensive. I didn't mean it that way. What do you want from me? I can never get it right for you. Wallace has longings and softer feelings under the protest too. When Wallace freezes, it means, I don't know what to say. I want to do the right thing for you. I don't want to fight, it'll only make things worse. I am overwhelmed and need to feel safe. Wallace's defensiveness really means, please accept me. I want to know you love me. I don't know what to do. I feel sad and lonely. Looking at the cycle this way, you can see how one affects the other, and the whole thing happens because they are so important to each other. The alarm gets so high that the cycle goes out of control. Here's where the science comes in. The red alert emergency in the brain makes the cycle fast, and the reactions make it strong. When we look at the steps one by one, in a safe environment like therapy, the emotional brain calms down, fight or flight hormones ebb, and the thinking brain can come back online. This slows the action of the cycle and they can start to separate from it. Now there's a possibility for new responses and reactions. They learn to recognize the cycle as the enemy, that endless loop of action and reaction that keeps them in misery. Coming together against the cycle means blaming the cycle and not each other, and that makes it smaller and slower and helps them feel calmer and more open to each other. 
Now Wallace and Pat can see and touch the longings and softer emotions they each have. They start to see each other in new ways, and they can understand and calm reactive emotions like anger. You know, this is another um, breakout room discussion because she makes some so many beautiful points. I'd like for you to maybe share that with some of your friends. I mean, that video says it all. Underneath all this is like I showed in the first clip. We have two people really wanting to be held and noticed and understood and loved. This is how God created us to be. Anything else is falling short. That's why our church is so beautiful. Uh, this week, we're going to remember St. John the Ladder. I want you to see this <clears throat> as we close tonight. And I want you to talk with your spouse. Any one or two things that kind of um, resonated with you in the invitation to love, conflict. The conflict is God's invitation, like it was invitation to Adam. It was an invitation for Adam to come to God, and he chose to do his own thing because he was afraid. And we want to have the courage. Look what happened. St. John, the ladder. <clears throat> we always wonder what those winged figures are. And if we can personify judgment, if we can personify anxiety, we can personify feeling stupid or not good enough or depression. That's what wants to pull us off our, our road to being winners in a relationship that keeps us from being connected to one another. It's not us. It's those things that wedge itself. There's only one enemy. Let me tell you, one enemy is not us. It's the devil. We saw that in the beginning that deceived Eve and is deceiving you and me when it gets between us. There's only one enemy. It's the, and, that's the, and there's only one war between God and the enemy. And he uses us as pawns to fight his battle. To heck with that. Let's redirect our life inward so we can offer God the best fruits that we can have. And next uh, month, Father Timothy is going to continue this. I, I'd like for you to read this. Okay, that. I'll read this um, from Father Thomas Hopko. Holy Father John of the Ladder, pray to God for us sinners. We believe, help our unbelief. Grant us the grace of fighting the good fight, keeping the course, ascending the ladder, which is in is descent together with humility of Christ. And when you can speak from the heart, I talk about the 30 centimeter descent. George mentioned that. We'll continue to mention that. The church mentions that. We don't want to go to the outer space. We don't care about that. We talk about the 30 centimeter descent from the head to the heart. When we can speak from that sacred space, we can move mountains. We can heal. We can change any kind of conflict to be beautiful. So George, we're going to pass it on to you. Thank you, so, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a blessing. Thank you, Father Tom. Um, so much to process there. And I think that I'd love to officially give homework to our participants because all this class is recorded and you can find the link. Um, I'd love for all of us to rewatch the Wallace and Pat video, the little cartoon figures. I'd love for that to be actually a, a Lenten exercise because during this period of great Lent, it is one of self-reflection, self-examination from the prayer, prayer of St. Ephraim, we're reminded not to judge. We're reminded to put away all the things that make us less than human, actually. And if you think about all the ways we get caught up in our conflict, we become less than human. We, get, we become less than the beautiful vessels that the Lord has created. I'd love, honestly, though, that each of us would look at that little cyclone cartoon and press pause as much as you can maybe a, a, over a cup of coffee, cup of tea, whatever, and, and just start talking about what the feelings are behind those patterns. It'd be absolute great use of time to use that little exercise. So we want to encourage that. I do want to mention in way of closing, I know we're short on time, so I'll, I'll just keep it at this thought. This Lenten journey is one of self-reflection, as I mentioned a moment ago. It's so fitting in marriage work. Because as a marriage family therapist now for 30 years, it's kind of like a, us therapists, we see it kind of like this, this, that one researcher calls it a cyclone. We often call it a merry-go-round. And that is very typically 
uh, a spouse wants their relationship to be better, but as soon as they see the defect in the other, it activates our defect. It almost feels like a fairness thing where, wait a minute, I, I'm not going to improve more than you because when you don't improve, something bad's going to happen. So then I'm all bets are off. And I just want to bring us back to Lenten journey because coming home to a better marriage is perfectly parallel to our Lenten journey. That we're on our journey back home to our hearts. We're on our journey back home to the Lord. We're on our journey back home to a better marriage. And that our eyes would be where they belong. And that is sort of working out our own salvation, if you will. That whenever any kind of cyclone happens, that our, our commitment is simply this, that we get a vision to be Christ-like in time of conflict. And we're not pagans. Pagans only say hooray to God when they have perfect circumstances, when the waters come, the rain comes down to, to water their crops, when, when everything happens the way they want it. The pagan way is circumstances will determine how close I am to God. We're not pagans. We will pursue the godly way, even when the circumstances, even when our spouse isn't cooperating with the conflict the way we wish they would. We won't put our eyes on the crops or the rain or the spouse. We're going to put our eyes on asking the Lord to help us in our time if we're going to be a triggered person to become less like him or if we find ourselves soothing and we give our heart to him, even our beating heart that is beating out of our chest where we want to fight back in an awful way, but we calm our heart with a connection with the Lord to calm us so that we could be the warm-hearted person, a soft answer turns away wrath. And so let's stay on that Lenten journey. Honestly, um, as you do, it's going to help me. And hopefully as I do, it's going to help you. And as a community, as a classroom, virtual classroom, we're going to help each other. And we're going to kind of feel that energy going across the country. Let's find that Lenten journey to calm our hearts, to show up in conflict in a way that every time the old way of conflict happens, that becomes our sacrifice to the Lord. So with mm -hmm. that, we thank you for your attention. We're really glad you're part of our friendship circle here, our classroom, our, our journey together by God's grace that we're, we're, going, we're going on his path and that we're really endeavoring to have a better marriage. So we love you guys. We, let's pray for each other. Things get tough sometimes. Things get stressful sometimes. As I said earlier, sometimes life gets in the way of that better marriage. Let's have the better marriage get in the way of life a little bit. Next May, May 13th, our dear beloved Father Timothy will be sharing Stop the Insanity. So we hope that you'll do um, continue to join us. You use the same link. And we're going to invite Father Jim Pappas now to um, give us our closing prayer. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. And we're going to invite Father Jim Pappas to give us a closing prayer. Thank you. Beloved Father. As we engage in strengthening our marriages, we seek your guidance and wisdom to help us prosper in our relationships. God, as true love, guide us to perfect love. Where there is hope, guide us toward hope eternal. As the Prince of Peace, guide us to perfect peace. Thus, may enmity and discord find no place when love exists. Thus, may despair and doubt and distrust be relinquished to reveal hope. Thus, may distress and agitation be replaced with peace and harmony. In all things, help us to find true intimacy, a new level of understanding. And if this connection, give us a valued reconnection. As you guide and guard our relationships, so in us the realization that no conflict is more important than the value I hold for my beloved. Pray yourself in us for a most perfect union. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Thank you so much, everyone. God bless Amen. you. Amen. Thank you. Hope to see you all next, next month. Next month. And blessed Pascha to everyone. Well, blessed Pascha. Yeah. Blessed Pascha. Coming home.